Hi everyone, my name is Mathilde and I am super happy to be here and to welcome you to my presentation, Taking the Quantum Leap with Go. So before we start, just a quick word about me. I am currently a PhD student uh, living in Switzerland and this is why you will see throughout the slides some pictures about the, the Alps and the mountains and all this kind of stuff. Regarding my research um, interest, uh, they range uh, through many applications and topics and uh, for example like privacy enhancing technologies or applied cryptography, I also, also enjoy looking at some uh, machine learning when needed. And um, today we're going to talk about a topic that is very dear to my heart, which is post-quantum cryptography. So it might sound uh, scary and overly complicated, but um, I will try to make it as fun, may I say, and simple as, as possible. Today, really, we're going to try to answer three main questions. So, of course, we're going to start with um, an introduction and I'm going to explain really what is going on, right? So everyone's talking about quantum, quantum computers, but why does it, what does it mean? What is this quantum threat really that people are getting so worried about? And um, after explaining a bit what is going on, I will motivate really um, the need for um, what we call post-quantum cryptography. So I'll explain how this threat is going to impact you and your project and um, why you should be interested in this presentation, basically. Finally, I will not leave you hanging with an existential crisis and I will conclude with the presentation of um, one library which comes as, as a solution to address the threat and uh, spoiler alert, this library was developed and is available in Go. Okay, so Quantum. Right, quantum computers. On the right, you can find a picture of the quantum computer. And other than being, um, I think, kind of pretty, they are a true technological marvel um, because they can perform some kind of computation ridiculously fast, faster than any kind of super, um, super computer could even dream of. And um, they will benefit many, many uh, research areas. So like I think about chemistry, I think about finances, healthcare, and so on and so on. So this is, this is a good start. But the issue is that because of these computational powers that um, let's say, enable people to compute things very, very fast, they threaten the security of the publicly cryptographic um, algorithm that we know and use nowadays. Something about RSC, PGP, all those algorithms will not protect our sensible information anymore. So that means, for example, that if you're sending like an encrypted message to someone, um, a person, an attacker who has access to a quantum computer can just run, the, uh, run a very powerful attack and just crack your message open like if it was not even encrypted and reading, read it in clear. This, this is disastrous, right? We don't want that. And as a side note, I think it's very interesting that because of the time frame, I don't, uh, I won't talk about it. The um, not only the probability cryptography is impacted, right? Uh, symmetric cryptography and hash functions also, um, how to say, suffer from a drop in security. Yet they are not completely broken the way probability cryptographic uh, algorithms are. Um, so this is going to be out of the scope of this presentation, but nevertheless. If you have questions about that, be happy to answer them. The public and cryptographic uh, algorithms that we use nowadays are not going to protect our messages anymore. And so what? Do we even need public cryptography, right? Can't we replace it? And the quick answer is we need public cryptography. So those of you who might be working in a security-related field might directly interact with encrypted data. Um, some others might be sending encrypted emails at work, relying on the VPN solution, um, digitally signing some documents, uh, looking at certificates, and why not, who am I to judge, buying some cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoins. All those technologies are only a sample about everything that we're doing in our online life whose security really relies on public key cryptography. And there is no replacement for that. We need public cryptography. You might be now having a follow-up question, which is, 
okay, okay, we need public cryptography, but we've been using this trick for many years of um, slowly but steadily increasing the, um, the key sizes, right? It was at first 128 bits, then 256, and so on and so on. Can't we just keep doing that? Unfortunately, we can't, because the way we foresee quantum, quantum computers to, to scale and uh, the powers we, we think they'll have, we calculated, I mean, the researchers calculated that, for example, if you want to use RSA, you will need one terabyte keys for your system to be secure. This is not memory friendly, this is not efficient, you do not want to go through the trouble of handling one terabyte keys. So, okay. We need public key cryptography and we need solutions that are not going to come at the cost of unpractical, uh, unrealistic key size or other consequences. And those alternatives are called the quantum safe alternatives, or as you might have heard of, the post quantum cryptography. So, post quantum cryptography has this very nice property of uh, in addition to being secure against the classical adversaries that we're used to, they are also secure against adversaries that have access to quantum resources. So meaning that even if this as as adversary was trying to run this very fast operation um, against um, post-quantum uh, cryptography, it would still be secure. Just as classical uh, cryptography, there exist different flavors of uh, post-quantum cryptography. So we can think about lattices, hash-based hash functions, um, isogenies, and so on and so on. All of these flavors have different uh, properties. So some are really going to target um, efficiency in terms really of uh, speed and performance, uh, while the other are going to look and minimize the output sizes. So really work with very small signatures, very small public keys, and so on and so on. So my guess is that uh, according to the requirements of your project or the, um, the technology that you're trying to make to make quantum safe, there is a techno um, how to say solution that is going to work with your um, objectives, right? If you're trying to be very bandwidth um, efficient, then I would suggest maybe to have a look at um, at uh, let's say Rainbow and uh, all this kind of stuff, which is a multivariate. Um, uh, technique. So maybe something that is also in the back of your mind is, okay, so now I'm talking about the threat, I'm talking about uh, we foresee things. Is there something that exists now and why should we talk about this now? So to answer the first question, um, what exists? Well, for now, quantum computers are at the stage of uh, prototypes, right? Um, and why we should talk about it now is because we know that we are super slow to integrate new tools and new technologies into whatever we're working on. Um, so even Git, I think it's I think it's a nice example because um, they I mean they have the the manpower to make things move if they wanted to. Um, so Git knew back then that SHA-1 hash function was broken. Um, but they took their time, right, to um, to change it to SHA-256. And they took so much time that actually some bad guys, um, just to prove a point, um, implemented an attack, uh, targeted the repo, and completely destroyed it. So that might, that might not be um, super, let's say, impressive, just to destroy, um, destroy uh, a repository, but if you think about it, if you think about, okay, I have a database of my password, which is being encrypted. Well, you don't want anyone to go and look at that um, and, and, and encrypt them and look at your password, right? You would not want that. So this is why it's important to anticipate really the fact that there are going to be quantum adversaries and go the fastest we can while still making reasonable decisions. So in front of uh, a few uh, in the slide, there is a very simplified version of um, an integration process. So of course, it starts with uh, some research, people designing new tools, new algorithms, and the standardization process. So community looking at what has been proposed, assessing their properties, and um, deciding, uh, agreeing on a few of them, which are going to be deemed as standards. 
So this step, uh, the standards are going to be announced by the end of this year, and I think maybe beginning of uh, 2022. Um, afterwards, after the standards are being announced, there's going to be an army of developers that are going to look at deploying um, the system, bringing them from theory to practice. Um, so I'm thinking about supporting different languages, uh, hardware, software, and so on and so on, to make really them accessible to anyone. And um, anyone being the project owners, which might then decide to create a fork and test the technology. And um, after a certain point, maybe eventually um, complete the transition and use this new tool, this new cryptography as the main component. So this is what we want with post-quantum cryptography, right? We want, we want uh, slowly, we want it slowly to replace what we've been using until now. And the um, issue and why there is this sense of emergency is that we don't know how much it's going to take before scalable com quantum computers are built. Uh, huge companies are putting even huger amounts of money um, into this research, and I think it's going to go even faster than anticipated. And if um, it is a case that scalable quantum computers are accessible to people with um, malicious intentions before the transition is complete, well, you're exposing yourself to the risks that we just um, went through, such as, for example, exposing all of your passwords online. When should we care about that? A quick and very marketing-like answer, me, maybe yesterday. We should have cared yesterday. If you want my personal opinion, I think you, I mean, you should care about it from like a developer point of view as soon as standards are being announced. Because uh, at this point, you're going to be able to see, okay, I can work with that. Let me see um, the feasibility. So I think this is um, this is a better answer, more honest. So, okay, so maybe by now I've convinced you that um, uh, the quantum uh, threat uh, concerns you and that you need post-quantum uh, uh, cryptography in your project. But of, I mean, I can understand that you don't want to have to go through the trouble of implementing it, testing it yourself, and so on and so on. We went ourselves through the trouble and we developed a post-quantum cryptography toolkit. So you can access it via the QR code on the slides, um, and I guess uh, the slides themselves are going to be available online. So, or you can email me or ping me and I'll be happy to send you the link. So we made our toolkit um, uh, open source, right? So you can really see what's happening inside them. You can try and understand what we did. And we implemented two algorithms. The first one being an encryption scheme um, whose name is Kyber. The second one is a signature uh, slash authentication scheme uh, called Dilithium. Both Kyber and Dilithium are part of what is called the Crystal Suite, which is a finalist in the NIST standardization competition that I mentioned, like this standardization competition that I mentioned, uh, that I mentioned a moment ago. So um, what it means is that people have valued really their security. They have uh, looked at it, assessed it rigorously. Um, also, they said that it was not coming up too much of a performance issue and so on and so on. And of course, as I said, uh, what a surprise, we developed these toolkits entirely in Go. We had um, a specific focus on security, right? So if we're talking about security, we were like, let's go all the way. So first step is to look at the algorithmic security. And this has been done by looking at the proofs, the, the following uh, carefully the pseudocode that the um, algorithm designer put online and this is as very like how to say easily checkable. We can uh, we can uh, how to say we can run like this little um, how to say a uh, known test answer vectors test and all of that. So this check. Um, in the second step, we were also thinking, okay, it's cool to be algorithmically secure, but there is also another point which um, is of concern, which is practical security. And practical security is enabled when really looking at the code, right? And how do you evaluate if one code is um, secure? This is up, um, this is very suggestive, right? I think uh, there is no tool yet to ensure that 
one code is very secure, whereas the other is um, very not secure. So what we did is that we enable practical security by implementing countermeasure uh, against a very specific class of attacks that are called side channel attacks. So it might get a bit technical at this point, but I think it's very interesting to look at these kind of attacks because they are um, super interesting and um, uh, for those of you who are developing security algorithms, it's very important that you know that they exist um, and how do they work. So you're playing a poker game uh, with your friends and um, really one key idea of poker is to keep your cards secret. Because if you're showing your cards to uh, your opponents, uh, they're obviously going to win. And even if you manage to keep your cards secret, you might still be kind of leaking some kind of information. So for example, if I look at the two, um, the two guys playing poker, my guess is that this guy, Fespimin himself, maybe he doesn't have that much of the good game he is expected to, whereas the guy smiling old teeth might have, I don't know, like um, um, a sweet or I don't know what. And um, so this is the same, the same way that side channel attacks work. You can gain information about a secret, so in, in this case the cards, by looking at all these little signs, external signs, right? So it can be um, the emotion, it can be like how is your adversary breathing, does he look stressed and so on and so on. And if we go back to our setup now, we can understand that the laptop is not going to try and hide some cards, but a key, and he's not going to be leaking some information um, through his smile or stress, but maybe through the time it takes to compute some operation or the power it consumes. And those are physical measurements um, that can be in, I mean, how to say, well, measured um, by an adversary and correlated back to the key. And if the key can be inferred, well, your algorithm, it can be the most algorithmically secure algorithm that exists. Once you know the key, you're allowed to do everything you want. So the sec I mean, there is not much security left. So this is very something very important to consider, this um, side channel attacks, right? So um, just yeah, to rewrite, uh, to reread what I said, what we did is that we looked through all the attacks targeting both Kyber and Lithium, the algorithm that we implemented, and one by one, we implemented the countermeasures. So we ended up with something that was um, very secure on top of just saying post-quantum security. And I think this is a, this is a great add-on. Finally, I mean, um, as a last point to uh, conclude this uh, post-quantum um, topic, I think it's interesting to look at the cost, really. So we will need post-quantum security. But what is going to be the cost of that, uh, that security? So what we did to assess the overhead is that we compared our algorithms against two algorithms that we picked from the Go official crypto library. So um, we, we picked the same level of security, of course, in the classical setting, because if you um, followed, you should know that um, what exists, what we've been using, ECDSA and RSA, are totally broken when facing quantum adversaries, so we don't want to go that way. So for the same level of security in the classical setting, we um, compared both the performance in terms of um, speed and the size of the outputs, right? And we can see actually quite surprisingly that uh, regarding the performance, our library performs way better than um, the, algorithm, the algorithms from the Go library. So in a uh, very light blue is our um, the runtime per operation of our library. And in dark blue, it's the time it takes per operation of either ECDSA or RSA. So of course, the smaller, the better, right? And um, okay, so far, so good. We, um, we have post-quantum security and we gain performance. What's more to ask, right? And I wish I could stop here, but actually there is a trade-off to this um, nice increase in performance, which is the bandwidth. So the bandwidth necessary to run Kyber and Dilithium is actually quite big. It is orders of magnitudes higher than what we're used to. 
So if we compare, for example, dilithium against ECDSA, I mean, you cannot miss it, right? Um, so this is something to keep in mind. So this is not going to be as disastrous as using a one terabyte key, right? Um, but still, it will have an impact, but it's good to know in advance. Because I wanted to conclude on, um, how to say, on a brighter and more, most positive note, I'm going to now present um, a little um, test that we did to make sure and to further evaluate this, like this overhead. And uh, what we did is that we took WireGuard, which is a VPN solution, which is available um, in Go and is open source. So we looked at the code, we identified where is the uh, publicly algorithms um, being used, and we replaced them by the alternatives offered by our library. We ran some tests, some benchmarks, and what we noticed is that the other head is not that big, right? There is the theory and then there is the practice. So every two minutes or so, you can expect another head of two extra IP packets being sent over the network. And regarding the time, there's going to be a little delay of half a millisecond. I don't know about you, but I can't notice half a millisecond delay. So I don't think I would even be able to tell which cryptography is being used um, if you're just giving me the software, which is actually the goal, right? We don't want to have to sacrifice anything in your application to have post quantum security. On this um, very good note, uh, on this very, um, uh, how to say, experimental uh, demonstration of the practicality of our library, I think it's a good step to, uh, to go through. The takeaway message really that I've been trying to to uh, say to come to today is a bit explaining what, what quantum is and that it's neither bad nor good uh, like um, all the technologies are, it's neither black or white. There's always this bit of grayish thing that depends on the context. And um, if you care about security, well, there is all those things that you can't really, uh, how to say, do anything on with these big tech, um, how to say, building softwares, except if you're working for uh, some of them. But at your local and for your projects, you can start having a look at what exists and how you can incorporate it into your infrastructure, right? And um, when, still I would repeat my personal opinion, of caring about this kind of thing as soon as standards are being announced. And um, moreover, if you're interested in having something which was developed in Go and has a very strong level of security, I would uh, also have a suggestion, uh, which is very personal, I would suggest you to use our library. And uh, at last but not least, I think um, if you want to help, well, there are many things that can be done. This um, practical security process that I mentioned, it's a continuous process. So attacks are going to be implemented. We will have to find defenses and implement them. So um, we would be very happy if this could be done in a very interactive process. So we welcome any kind of um, pull request or contribution on this side to make our library even safer, which is the, uh, of course, the end goal. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I'll be hanging in the Discord um, in the Discord chat. So yeah, drop me a message. I wish you a very good day.